In today's practical, we continue where we left off last time. Uh, we ended the last uh, lab-based practical by talking about data management and concluded that it was really important to make sure that your data is stored in a place and in a format that will be accessible and understandable to you and to other users of your data in the future. Today we change tack a little bit and we look at how to find relevant scientific literature, how you would go about formatting a scientific report as if it was going into the scientific literature, and then we end with an outline of the assignments that you will need to complete for this practical component of the BOT 358 module. So first let's think about what we mean by the literature. Well this is all published scientific work. We can split this into two groups. The first is primary literature and this is original research. So where you've gone out and you've collected your own data and you've analyzed it and you've interpreted it and you've written about it. The literature also comprises the secondary literature which is reviews of published works. So where someone takes a whole bunch of primary literature and reviews it and synthesizes it and comes up with some interesting conclusions. So what makes the scientific literature different from other literature? So why is a article out of a scientific journal different from an article out of a magazine or a newspaper or a blog? And the simple answer here is that scientific literature goes through peer review. What do we mean by that? Well, this is the process um, where independent and anonymous colleagues who are suitably qualified critically evaluate the quality of the research before it's published. This can be a really time-consuming process, uh, but is critical and is key to the scientific publication process. The idea here is that you have an expert in the field reading what you've written, um, and then critically evaluating it. So they'll ask, has the data been collected in the right way? Has it been analyzed in the right way? Is the um, article acknowledging the work that was done previously? Um, are the findings uh, logical and are they being interpreted in the right way? Because peer-reviewed publications have gone through this level of scrutiny, they are considered to be the most reliable and the highest quality reports of science that's been conducted. You could see it as the gold standard. You can trust a peer-reviewed publication um, almost completely. Of course there are problems that creep in, but it is our best system at the moment for making sure that science um, that the science that's reported has been done correctly. Because of this high standard, um, peer-reviewed publications are formally archived. There are big libraries across the world where these are archived and they're permanently stored. So one of my favorite examples is 200 years ago, uh, Dr. John Todd published this paper about um, an electric skate uh, that he found uh, off the shore of Cape Town. And even though this was published 200 years ago, we can still find it, we can still access it easily, we can read it, we can use his research to inform our own research. So this is why um, you, you could imagine if this was not peer-reviewed, uh, we wouldn't trust it, we wouldn't look after this article for 200 years. Now, the literature is incredibly large. There are thousands of papers being added daily, probably thousands just in the field of ecology. And because of this, we need to be able to search the literature easily to find what's relevant to us. Now, Thomson's Reuters, the media company, maintains a list of peer-reviewed journals. And they've got a whole bunch of strict criteria that the journals have to meet. But pretty much if a journal is on their list, uh, you know that everything published in it is been scrutinized, has been checked carefully, um, and you should be able to rely on. 
they keep this list of peer-reviewed journals in an index of all the articles published in them um, on a website called the Web of Science, sometimes called the Web of Knowledge, which you guys can all access through the UP library. So if you go to e-resources and then databases A to Z, you'll find Web of Science and Web of Knowledge there. And this is essentially a massive database that's completely searchable and it indexes all the peer-reviewed publications by title, author and abstract. So if you wanted to find out research that's been conducted on the Mahalisberg and published in a peer-reviewed journal, <coughs> you could, for example, go to that website and search for Mahalisberg. Sometimes, <coughs> sorry. Sometimes you might find an article that mentions, for example, the Mahalisberg uh, in the main text of the article, but it wasn't mentioned in the abstract. And in that case, um, the Web of Science might miss it. So the advantage of the Web of Science is that it's incredibly um, carefully checked. The problem is that it might miss um, keywords that are not in the abstract of an article. This is where Google Scholar has some benefits. Now it's less rigorous because it'll search anything that is vaguely scientific. So you might find uh, books on there, which is, which is sometimes useful, but you might also find uh, reports that someone has written but no one has peer-reviewed, things like that. But Google Scholars, of course, um, often will be able to search the entire contents of a, a, a document. So sometimes that's good for also for finding information. There are, of course, many other um, databases online. Scopus is a good example. Uh, and they fall somewhere between Web of Science and Google Scholar. Okay, so communicating your science. Why is this important? Well, I remember very clearly uh, a phrase that someone used in my honors year. They said to our class, if you don't publish your work, it doesn't matter. Okay, they didn't mean it doesn't matter, you don't need to worry about it. They mean no one's going to care about your work unless it's published. Now that's maybe a little bit harsh, but it's pretty close to the truth. Your science is only useful, your research only has value when it is shared widely and efficiently and effectively. You could do the most amazing work about um, how to cure AIDS and cancer, but if no one finds out about that research, it has surely got no value. Now there are many different ways to communicate your science. Uh, as we said, the highest standard is a peer-reviewed scientific paper or article, but you could also use reports uh, you'll often have to write reports to the people who provide the money for you to do your research or provide the study sites or the specimens. Research can also be presented in, as a thesis chapter or an essay. And verbally, one would often give conference talks or show a poster. That's also ways to communicate. Now, fortunately, these uh, ways of communicating science are by far the most common. and They all share the same structure, and that's the structure we're going to go across grow through now. And it's the same structure that we're going to expect you guys to use in your reports. It's also worth just mentioning that science can, can, be, can be communicated in popular articles as well as in web documents. I'm thinking here of blogs or um, even videos. But those follow different formats generally. Okay, so what is the format of a scientific paper? Generally this is the format that we follow. Uh, the areas in purple make up the bulk of an article and we're going to go through them in detail but I want you to also to see the areas in grey uh, because they're also important. So we start with an abstract which is kind of just a summary of a paper. We then have an introduction, a method section, results, discussion and then sometimes a conclusion, usually acknowledgements where you thank the people who've made the research possible and then references. Now the reason that the structure is used repeatedly is that it helps keep research and the communication of research very clear. Each of these sections has its own specific purpose and you need to make sure that when you're writing in this format that you keep those sections um, very clear individually and also that you keep them separate. That you don't bring methods into the results section and that you don't bring results into the discussion section. Okay, so let's go through those 
purple sections. Now this is maybe the most basic slide that you'll see in this presentation, but I would say it's probably the most important. When writing an article, it follows this pattern of starting very general, becoming specific, and then going back to being general. So that's kind of what that hourglass shape shows there. The width of the bar represents how general it is. The idea here is that an introduction, when a reader starts in it, needs to be very general. It needs to explain um, broadly about the field that your research is conducted in. Methods and, res and it then becomes very specific, narrowing down to exactly what you're going to do. The methods and results are limited and focused very specifically on your exact work. And then the discussion will start by considering your results, but then will again broaden to become general to explain how these results matter to everyone else. Now, what I'd like you to do here is to um, dig out the example paper that you have, a scientific article from a peer-reviewed journal. And as we go through these next sections, I want you to have a look at your article and see if you can find um, the relevant sections. Of course, not all journals follow these exactly. If you go and look at short communications in some of the top journals, they will kind of merge these. They won't have uh, clear headings. But for the majority of journals, this is what you'll be looking at. Okay, so you can just pause this presentation, have a look at your article, and then resume it again. Okay, so let's look at the introduction. This is the first part of the main body of the text, and it's providing the context of the research that's being written about. By the context, I kind of mean it's, I mean it's setting out a framework. It's explaining... Um, how this work fits in with the rest of the scientific literature in the field. So we could say that you're in the introduction first documenting our current understanding of a field and then detailing the current gaps in our understanding. And through this you really provide a motivation for the study. So grab your article and have a look at your introduction. And I want you to focus on the first sentence in the introduction and then see how very broad that is, how it is applicable or of interest to people from a diversity of fields. So if you were to maybe look at the example of the race paper from South African Journal of Botany that I made available to you, you'll see its first sentence starts, It is widely recognized that plants support important ecosystem services. So you can see that's really a broad um, introductory statement. Even though this paper is focusing on Southeast Asia and it's focusing on legumes, they provided the context for the research by saying uh, that plants provide important ecosystem services. You'll see then the next paragraph starts, Among the shared plant families on the tropical continents, the legumes stand out because they dominate the rainforests of both Africa and the Neotropics. So there that second sentence has now got much more specific. We know that we're dealing with legumes and we know that we're dealing with tropical areas. And then this will continue. The last sentence, sorry, the last paragraph of the introduction will then somewhere contain an AIMS statement. So again in that race paper you'll see halfway through the, the last paragraph of the introduction it says there, the aim of this research is to assess how accurate the diversity patterns of legumes, etc., etc. So you see there, there's a very clear and explicit statement about what the aim of the paper is. So have a look in your paper and see if you can find an aim at the end of the introduction, and you can see how the introduction starts general and becomes specific. The aims statement will sometimes not be worded as an aim, but in the uh, Mustakas paper from PLOS One that I've also made available, you'll see that they write, in this study we examine the effects of isolated tree on grass biomass. Okay, so that's a, a, just a different way of presenting the aim of the study. Now the next section is methods and materials. Sometimes this is called materials and methods, sometimes just methods. Uh, this is 
uh, a recipe section. It just lists all the steps that, must, that you followed when you were conducting your research and it allows the methods that you use to be completely repeatable. What's key here is that you're excluding irrelevant details. You won't, for example, say that you drove a Honda to your study site because people are able to repeat your work even though they're driving in a different type of car to the study site. Okay, so we just try and focus on really the key details. So again, you can look in your um, paper and you can look for the method section. Sometimes the method section will start with a bit of a description of the study site where you did the work or the study species that you're working on. And then you'll see there's a lot of very detailed data about how, uh, very, very detailed writing about how the data was collected and how it was analyzed. And that really then allows everyone else to repeat that work. So have a look at your method section, give it a read. And what comes after that then is the results. Now if the method section is a recipe, then the results section is kind of just like a fact sheet. And just a list of exactly what was found in the data and when the data was analyzed. So it's a really objective presentation of what came out of analyses. By objective, I mean you're not interpreting your results. You're not saying whether anything you found was good or bad. You're just saying, this is the facts. This is what we observed. The results section, though, also often uses figures or tables to present data. Now, you would use a figure or a table when it's more efficient to uh, present the data in a figure or a table than it is to write out in full. Uh, and that helps to keep the results section short and also interpretable. So again, let's page and have a look at some of the figures and tables. So you'll see in the race paper, they have a map. That's something that if you had to write it out, would take up an incredible amount of space. So it's good to use it um, as a figure. You'll see also there they've got table one where they show the number of species per family. And again, if one had to write that out in full sentences, it would take up a lot of space. If we flip across to the Mustakas paper, you'll see there also the tables contain information that would take a lot of space to write out in full. And then in figure one, you can see very neatly and clearly illustrated we have the relationship between the distance from a tree canopy and grass biomass and again that is easy to interpret and it presents the information in a very summarized way. Now one of the important criteria which most journals ask you to ensure is that your figures and tables can stand alone. In other words you need to be able to interpret a figure or a table without having any other information provided. There are lots of guidelines to how figures and tables can be um, presented and drawn that they're most efficient. And I'd encourage you to have a look at some of those guidelines. So I just want to run through some examples that I think are very clear. Here we have uh, some work published by a colleague who is looking at how an invasive grass across the Stoloniferous spread across Marion Island. And you can see there's a star indicating where it was recorded in 1966 and then the dark shading where it was found in 1975 and then the light shading about where it was found in 1995. And you see in the figure legend, okay, and this is the sentence written at the bottom of a figure. It's important a figure legend always goes under a figure. Um, everything is explained as necessary. Figures don't always have to be maps or graphs. They can also be drawings and here this is a diagram which illustrates vegetation structure in a um, uninvaded and an invaded uh, drainage line and again you see the figure legend is very clear this then is a much more typical uh, graph here you can see the range size of alien species on Marion and Prince Edward Island through time. You can see we've got very clear symbols and lines of different forms and together we can see a clear pattern. Here's a table 
so this isn't a table that is um, showing a lot of numbers but it's still densely compressing data and it's showing whether agrostis stolonifera is present in the different vegetation types in Marion Island. Okay so pause here and have a look at your paper and see the different types of tables and the different types of figures that have been used. You'll note on the tables the legend or the caption is written above the table. You'll also see that generally on tables they minimize the number of lines so if you are working in Excel it will automatically give you all the vertical and horizontal lines but that usually just makes a table look uh, cluttered and those are often uh, minimized. Okay so the final main section in a manuscript is the discussion and it's exactly like its name suggests in this you are discussing what you have found. In the results you just presented the facts and the numbers and here you interpret those facts and those numbers. You explain to readers why you think what you observed <coughs> sorry you explain to readers why you think you observed what your results show. So if you found <clears throat> that fires tended to be more frequent in Feinbos than in Savannah, you'd explain why you think you observed that. You'll also then, and that's that narrow part of the discussion where you're being very specific about your findings, you then generalize it, um, pointing out agreement or disagreement with other previous similar studies, and you also make sure that you answer all the questions from your introduction. So if your introduction asked the question, does tree cover differ between the north and southern aspects of the Michalisberg, you have to make sure that you explicitly answer that question. Now, as we said, the discussion is going to generalize results from your study to be of relevance to the broader community. By that we mean, even though your study was maybe conducted at one site or with one species, you want to point out to your readers why it might be relevant to them if they're working in a different site or working on different species. So again, have a look at your discussion in your paper and you'll see how it starts very uh, specific and ends rather general. So if we look at the Mustakas paper in the discussion section, it starts, our results indicate that the nature of tree grass interactions changes from positive to negative across a gradient of increasing precipitation. So that's kind of a, a very specific statement related just to their work. You go to the end of their discussion and you see sentences like, future studies should focus not only on isolating the different mechanisms by which increases in tri tree size influence grass biomass, etc. So there they're generalizing it. They're saying, hey, to everyone out there, if you're going to do a similar project, this is what we think you should be uh, making sure you examine. Okay, so that's part of that generalizing the results. See if you can find that same pattern in your paper's discussion section. Now, just to touch on some of the other sections um, that are much shorter, the first thing is that every paper, and indeed every thesis chapter and report, has a title. This needs to be short enough to be easily understood, but it must also catch the attention of intended readers. So you don't want to have a, um, a title that starts, Vascular plant richness on the Michalisberg is inversely related to fire frequency, but only on the top of the ridge. Okay, too much information, it's not going to catch anyone's attention. But equally, you can't say something like um, fire determines species richness because then you're uh, leaving out a lot of the relevant details. So it's a bit of a balance. And again, have a look at the title of your article and see how it balances being specific and being general. Now the abstract, as I said earlier, is kind of a summary of the entire paper. And for that reason, it's probably the most important part of a paper since most people will just have a look at the abstract and decide whether they're going to read the whole paper or not. The conclusion is a section that some journals ask for and others don't. It comes right after the discussion and is meant to summarize the main results and important discussion points. 
If you're going to write a discussion section, though, you just need to make sure it isn't a repetition of the introduction and the discussion. You need to actually conclude with something um, that you haven't written already. And then there are acknowledgments, and this is kind of the one uh, part of the scientific article which is maybe a little bit more casual. And that's where the authors can thank their funders and everyone who provided substantial input or support. So often people will have to thank their funders for the money that supported the research and the people who helped them. Um, and sometimes they'll just give general thanks to those involved with the research. You'll also put permit numbers there if your research required permits. So have a quick look at your paper, see if it has a conclusion, see what the abstract is called. Some journals call it a summary, um, others call it an abstract. Some won't even give it a title, they'll just provide it. And then maybe have a look at what's, what and who is acknowledged in the acknowledgement section. Now we haven't listed the reference list yet and you'll see in your paper that's the last section in every paper usually. Um, we're going to get to that in a moment. But I want to just touch on how one would go about writing um, a scientific article. Now this obviously depends on your own style and your own way of doing things. Um, but let me make a suggestion here. So typically at school we taught um, when we learn to write, we start with putting together a few words which form sentences. We put sentences together to form paragraphs. We make sure we write enough paragraphs that we can have a complete essay. That is not a good way to write a scientific article. Instead, what we should be doing is we should be thinking about what the main message is of our paper. Is our main message that... Um, fire must be included in conservation planning? If so, then we have to make sure that the paragraphs are arranged in a way that we make that argument, that we make that point very clearly and efficiently. Um, and then once you know what information needs to be in each paragraph, then you carefully craft sentences that convey that meaning in a way that's not ambiguous, you know, the way that's completely clear and concise. And then you choose the specific words um, that make sure that your meaning can't be misunderstood. Okay, so it's always good to start with what the main aim of your uh, report or paper is and then to split that into sections and each section gets split into paragraphs and then you only do you start crafting your sentences. And indeed when you're crafting your sentences you really are having to write very carefully. You can't do this the way that you would quickly type out an SMS. It's okay if your friend doesn't quite understand your SMS, they can write back and say, hey, just explain. Did you mean we're going to meet at the mall or we're going to meet in the mall? But we don't have that luxury with scientific writing. Because science must be completely repeatable, even 200 years after we've done the work, we need to report all the details required for an independent scientist to be able to replicate our work. And when we say all the details, we mean all of the relevant details in a way that's not confusing at all. Okay, we achieve this by using words and by using phrases that are concise. In other words, they shorten they to the point. We use only the words and the phrases that are essential, so we don't provide unnecessary detail. We need to be precise in our writing and our choice of words. We can't use vague terms. Um, we can't say, we sampled in summer, if we sampled you know, on the 15th of January, and that's important. And we use words and phrases that are simple. It's even though writing for scientific journals generally happens in English and maybe another four or five languages, the people who read those articles come from every language group in the world. So we don't want to try and um, show off our grasp of English, we want to show off our science. And to do that, we keep our writing very clear and we use familiar words and phrases that there can't be misunderstanding. <clears throat> Related to that, when you are composing a paragraph, I just want to highlight this. A paragraph should contain one idea. So if you're going to write about, for example, how um, geology affects species composition on the Michalisberg, 
put that idea into one paragraph. Don't then add in fire and climate effects in the same paragraph. That paragraph also needs to have a structure. You start with an introductory sentence or an introductory idea at least and you end with a con connecting and concluding sentence. Concluding it wraps up what was said in that paragraph and connecting it connects to the next paragraph. It helps the reader see what the next idea is that you're going to discuss and how it's related to the previous idea. And then between that first and last sentence you have supporting sentences where you present all of the uh, information that you think is most relevant. Just to illustrate this, if you look at the Mustakas paper, you'll see the third paragraph of the introduction gives a good example of this. It starts, savanna trees can facilitate grasses and continues. Okay, so there we see the idea in this, the idea is going to have something to do with how savanna trees and grasses interact and how that interaction can be positive. Then we look in the body and we see examples in that paragraph of previous studies which have shown um, these interactions. And then it ends with a concluding sentence. Overall, findings in savannas have shown that both, posit both facilitation and competition can occur. Okay, and there we see it's summarized what the, the, the other sentences in the paragraph have said. Um, and it ends with the idea, and that competition and facilitative effects do not always balance. Okay, and there that kind of gives us a clue that in the next paragraph we're going to be talking about how the positive and the negative interactions balance or don't balance each other out. Good, so take a moment and have a look at one or two paragraphs in your articles. Now at the end of pretty much every scientific article you're going to find a long list of references or a reference list, sometimes also called literature used, titled literature used. And this is where you list every paper that provided um, key information for your uh, research. The idea is that in science almost all statements must be backed up. So you can't just say the Michalisberg is a um, quarter of a billion years old. You need to tell us where you got that information from. And that, that would be a citation. Now there are some basic uh, things that generally are accepted without a reference. Um, so for example, methods that are really frequently used, you wouldn't have to uh, provide a reference where you could go and look at uh, the details for that method. Equally for common information, if you said, for example, Michalisberg is located in South Africa, you wouldn't need to provide a citation for that, just kind of general knowledge. Okay, so these um, citations, which is where in the text you um, say where you got the information, and these references, which is uh, the full details of the article that you or the book that you found the information in, these provide two purposes. Firstly, as I said before, Oh, sorry, firstly it provides justification for our assumptions. So if we say we assume that using um, a visual estimate of cover is a good representation of the actual cover, um, we could provide a reference there to say just to we could provide a reference there to an article which has actually tested that. Okay? More importantly, I think. These citations and the references also acknowledge previous research and contributions. Okay, so we give credit to those who've developed or disproved ideas, those who've collected and done the work before us that our work is based on. Now, every journal, almost every journal, has its own intricacies about how to format a citation and a reference. And for that, you need to look in the author guidelines. So for the main report that you'll be doing, um, the reports that you'll be doing for, for in this module, we're asking you to follow the format of South African Journal of Botany. So you want to follow that format closely and on ClickUp I've already published the journal's author guidelines. So it says exactly the formatting that should be used. Now here you don't need to worry about you know what font is used or what text size or what color your text is. Here we're talking about 
the raw text, making sure that things are written in the right way. We're not talking about um, typogra We're not talking about you know what, how many columns you should use. Okay, so how to cite a paper? So let's say you're doing research on Marian Island, and you want to say that Azarella salago um, is the dominant plant in Marian. So in the text, you'll maybe write, Azarella salago occurs on Marian Island. And then in brackets, after that statement, you will provide the citation. Citation here is the surname of the first author and the year that the work was published. So it was Brian Huntley who published it in 1972. So we'll say, Azarella salago occurs on Marian Island, open brackets, Huntley, 1972, close brackets. Um, if they're more than... If there are two authors, you might say Huntley and McGeoch, 1972. If there are three or more, you, you usually say Huntley et al. And et al simply means and others. But you don't want a list of 30 authors. The details about this, as I said, you can find in the author guideline. And there's also a document I've uploaded uh, to ClickUp, which gives some of these um, pointers about how to do this. You can also... Um, put the name of the author into the sentence. So you could say, according to Huntley, Azarellus Lago occurs in Marion Island. And then just to indicate which Huntley publication said this, you'll in brackets after Huntley's surname put 1972. So whatever you cite in the text, you have to be able to then find in the reference list. And this reference list provides all the details necessary to find the publication or the software or the book whatever it is where you got your information. The standard format, South African Journal of Botany, would be we'd list the surname and the initials of the authors, then the year. Now pay attention here, some uh, journals put the year in brackets, some put it just between commas, um, and then the title of the article, the journal that it was published in, the volume number, and the page numbers. And again, pay special attention to the format here. So the African Journal of Botany will italicize the journal name and it'll put in bold the volume name. So these fine details uh, can seem really um, unnecessary. But part of it is if you don't show attention to detail here, how does your reader know that you've shown attention to detail when you were collecting and analyzing your data? So consider it kind of a test of your meticulousness. So take a moment and have a look at the reference list on your paper. You'll see the Mustakas paper. Instead of listing the author's surname and year of publication in the text, they just put square brackets and a number. Okay, and that number then corresponds with the um, reference list. On the other hand, in the Reyes journal, uh, Reyes article, you'll see they use the more standard format of listing the author, the year, and then that matches up with the author and the year um, in the reference list. Okay, so as I said, when you've got two or more authors, you'll use et al, which is Latin for and others. Remember to have the full stop after L, because L is an abbreviation. Um, as I said, your in-text citations and your reference list must match up. You can't list something in your reference list that you haven't cited in the text. And then pay careful attention to how you cite a journal article versus citing a book versus citing a website. So the same way the Mustakas paper uses numbers, so in nature you can see here they've used a superscript 1 and 2 and those then match up with the reference list. As I said, we're going to use the South African Journal of Botany style. Um, yeah, so there's an example from a paper. You can look at how that maybe differs from the paper that you have with you. And there's the guidelines for author, just a selection of it. And this really then shows you exactly how you should be citing uh, your references following their format. And you'll see it says there, um, 
how to reference a book, how to reference a chapter in an edited book, and there are also examples of how to reference a website in some of their latest articles. And there's just an example, and you see the bottom right there, there's an example of how to reference a website that comes from the South African Journal of Botany. So if you're going to be referencing a website, that's what I'd like to see. It's worth just noting there that accessed 20 July 2013, that's a way, since websites are forever changing, for us to know, or for the reader to know, which version of the website you saw. Okay, now here we need to pause for a moment and touch on something very, very important. I've mentioned it once before and we need to mention it again. When you are writing something, you should not copy and paste text from your source. If you copy and paste text, you must put that text within quotation marks and provide a clear and accurate citation. So you have to say, hey guys, I did not write this sentence or this paragraph myself. It comes from a certain author. Okay? <clears throat> So ideally, you're going to first read the relevant literature. You're going to find the couple of articles that seem relevant. And you're going to internally synthesize that information. In other words, in your head, you're going to say, okay, what did all of these articles mean? What did they say? And then finally, you write your, your summary of that information and you provide citations for the details. Okay, that's the perfect way to do it. At a minimum, though, at the very least, you're going to take the original statement, don't copy and paste it, but you're going to read it and then rewrite it in your own words and then provide a citation for that source where you got the information. By rewriting the original statement in your own words, you are showing that you understand what that original statement meant. And you're also, by providing a citation, acknowledging the person who did the work before. Failure to do this, failure to acknowledge that you've um, used someone else's sentence or that you've used their idea or their findings is plagiarism. And this is the worst kind of academic dishonesty and fraud and is something that requires disciplinary action. So our faculty has, our department and our faculty have disciplinary uh, procedures in place and if you are caught plagiarizing if you're caught presenting someone else's words, ideas, or actions as your own original work, it will have very serious repercussions um, for your time at the university and for your academic career. Just to highlight there, ignorance is no excuse. You can look at plagiarism.org. It has very good resources to explain plagiarism, to explain the different types, um, our library also has a good plagiarism website and offers training in plagiarism. So this module will be taking plagiarism very seriously, so please, if you're in doubt about what constitutes plagiarism, have a look at the online resources or talk to someone at the library or come and talk to one of us.